I don't know exactly what grade like human humanity as a whole deserves as like our competence level right now. Like if you were God and grading us as a teacher on like how well we were playing the game that we were given. There is a moral case for technology and I would love for you to shed a light for our listeners on what is that this case? How, how can we shed a light on this? Anybody would be very hard pressed to name a technology in human history that has not done more good than harm. Turning inwards of like, oh, there's too many people. The technology's bad. We're ruining the environment. It's like, no, human, humanity is this beautiful gift. We are the only conscious beings that we are aware of. We are the universe like looking at itself. And is a sunrise beautiful or is it beautiful because we're here to observe the beauty of the sunrise and consider it beautiful? I see a utopia where we are very much embracing how good it feels to be around each other, how good it feels to do physical manual work, but also how positive it is to create technology, to build robots, to generate nuclear electricity, nuclear power. I think those two things can coexist in the optimal sort of world that I see us getting to. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this very special edition of Through Conversations podcast, where I'm joined by the brilliant Eric Jorgensen. Eric, thank you for joining me today. Uh, it's good to talk to you, always, and it's good to finally record one. Yes, I'm so excited when I saw that you were coming to the show. I was like, thank God, because I have so many questions for you in terms of your perspective on life, the way you're managing multiple endeavors, multiple projects at the same time and doing so successfully. And not only that, at the same time, you're doing a leg up for people. You're paying it forward in your way, which is not only just writing a book that is, you know, infinitely valuable, but doing it sometimes for free. You're just publishing it in your websites for free. And that in itself, paradoxically, has increased sales. But let me just ask you that question. So... A lot of people, when they publish a book, they put the gatekeep sense in it, which is, you know, just pay for it. But you've been, your two books, The Almanac of Nabal Ravikant and The Anthology of Balaji, here they are, favorite books, they're for free in your website. So I have the PDF copy right here, and I have the book physical. So how has that worked for you in terms of publishing, and what surprises have you found doing this approach? Yeah, well, I don't, uh, I don't want to take too much credit for it personally. It was um, Naval's idea and condition for writing the book in the first place. Um, mm. So credit where credit is due for him. Um, I also think, I do think there's a paradox there where it helped reach more people, more corners of the world, help people sort of see what the book was about. And I've received a ton of messages from people who read it, the free version online and were like, oh my God, this is great. I need to buy it. And so they go buy it or they gift it to somebody or it just helps. Um, I think there's a viral factor to a great book and people who read it and enjoy it, recommend it to, to other people. And a free digital version helps create that sort of feedback loop. Um, I also think it's good for the world. You know, like we've all learned so much from all the free things that we've been able to read online. I think there's a great like internet ethos around it. I think that the concept that information wants to be free is generally good. Um, and you know, I, I earn plenty of money on these books. Like if I can reach more people and give it away for free, like in general, people who can afford to buy the books, buy the books, um, and people who can't wouldn't have bought it anyway. So getting messages from people who like, like when the anthology of biology came out, I got a message from somebody who had downloaded the PDF, printed it out at home, like bound it herself and was like reading it in a remote place in, I think it was Vietnam, like the day the book came out, like an hour later. And, uh, that's the kind of stuff you just can't, it doesn't happen with a like, traditional supply chain. And so being able to reach everyone on earth who is interested in this and support them at whatever level they want to engage with, I think is I think is a way forward. I think a lot of authors could um, could continue to explore that. I hope they do. It's not something that, uh, you know, I don't expect traditional publishers to adopt that very often, but um, I, I think there's some real benefits to it. And, you know, uh, just credit Naval with sort of throwing that condition on and accidentally, then I learned how powerful it could be. And now I intend to sort of carry that on, certainly through the rest of this series and maybe through all the rest of my books. The way, honestly, the way I want to do my own book in itself is just try to gift it as much as I can to all, all the people in the world. Because I know that, for example, you've discussed this in both of your books and also the ideas that you've explored 
on X, everywhere that where you write, even in your newsletter, it seems as though we've created this premium into commoditizing everything, even creativity, right? So we're focused on creating that product, but we've lost the incentive or the incentive has changed into just sharing your creativity. So by being obsessed into, you know, selling it and making sales, we lost the mm -hmm. touch of, of, of sharing the, the writing that's almost therapeutical. When I finished my book, I felt such a relief that it, something was just channeling through me, right? And it had mm -hmm. to be written. And now everything is tailwind. Now, now everything should be shared. So what are your thoughts on this perspective? Yeah, I think it's the internet is an incredible tool for getting real time feedback on your writing or your thoughts uh, and for attracting the people that are interested in what you are innately interested in and where your creativity goes. Um, but I think it does take a tremendous strength of character or strength of will to stay driven by your curiosity and not just chase the, the numbers or um, go where the audience leads you. Uh, it, it, this is a concept, I think it's starting to be known as audience capture where you can watch creators or writers or, you know, YouTubers or whatever sort of descend into madness as they like just chase whatever is working and they get progressively more and more and more extreme. I think there was a story about a YouTuber who I can't remember their name, but started out doing something really benign, something basic, you know, tutorials about something and found out that their eating videos like did the best. And like extreme eating videos. And then like five years later, there's a photo of this guy like before and after. He literally looks like Jabba the Hutt. He's like 400 pounds, 500 pounds. He's like on oxygen, morbidly obese, like edge of death. And it's such a perfect example of audience capture of like that's, if it's not food, it might not be so visible, but that is where you go if you just get more and more extreme ideologically to chase a more and more fringe or even a more and more mainstream like set of ideas. So um, to me, working on a book is actually, it's such a big commitment that, and it takes place over such a long period of time. It's a little bit easier for me to be like, no, I'm not spending three years of my life on that thing, even though it would probably work because that's not what I'm interested in. Like if I think about what I want to bet three years of my life on, it's only to get immense personal satisfaction or personal growth out of doing that I would choose to do on my own. Um, so that I think one is like working on larger form factors, thinking in longer, larger terms. Um, and from that context, you can sort of use the feedback, the quick feedback loop of the internet to sharpen your, um, you know, your skills or your senses or your ideas in service of that bigger thing. But, you know, yeah, let's not ever lose sight of the fact that like, you know, you're, you're doing it for yourself at the end of the day. Like, and I don't think there's anything wrong when we do our best work, um, our most patient work, our most intense work when it's comes from within, not from trying to please someone external. Yeah. And I think, I guess that that relates to everything across the world and itself. And it's, it's becoming much and much more complicated trying to, work from within, internalize it, because even at least my age, you know, mid-20s, Gen Z, we're being captured to over-metricalize everything. Everything is metrics mm -hmm. or likes, and everything is just evaluated through this input of social feedback through a uh, magic screen, which is our phones, right? And and this social feedback that you, that we get. And so I have three, the three pa paths that I can go from here. I think that the first, the two relate to what you're saying is that we're being captured, again, I think my generation more than others, with this dopamine addiction where we can't really see long term. Even when I'm young, I, can, I can't envision, I've always told my best friends, I can't see myself when I'm 60. Like, I don't yeah. know, how, is, <laughs> how am I going to look when I'm old, you know? I, I already feel old, so yeah. what the hell? Um, so I feel that... On your, I would love to hear your perspective because you mentioned long term. So for younger people, how do we start harvesting? You know, you, you've written about Naval and Balaj who really emphasize long term thinking. But how do we harvest at this age 
with all of these other external factors playing at hand, which are everything should be short term, instant gratification, you know, likes, putting metrics over everything and just shedding, putting away the awe in life in itself in the long journey. Uh, there's a little bit of like a secret of life involved in that. I think, um, that's, that's a big question to answer, I suppose. Um, I think learning, I think there's a few answers to that. There's a few different ways that'll work for different people. Um, one of the things that I remember learning that helped me get a different sort of mindset was understanding the that being youthful and impatient, like impatience is the natural state of youth. Hmm. And there's a reason for that. Like the, the reason that babies like instantly cry when they encounter something that they don't like, they, they have no perception that that's going to be temporary. And it's all the reactions are so extreme. And you see the same thing in teenagers. You see the same thing. Like you, you think of yourself through every stage of that as, the oldest you've ever been, as you pointed out, right? Like when you're 15, you're experiencing this problem for the first time. You feel like it'll always be that way. Like you can't imagine how it ever gets better. And at 25, you think of 15 year olds as being like, oh my God, so like, they're so emotional. They're so spiky. They're so, but like from a 35 year old's perspective, a 25 year old is the same way. And that person changes so much as they grow. So like understanding to a certain extent, like a little bit of just acceptance that when you only have, you know, four years of work life experience, you are like, oh my God, why am I not? Why haven't I been promoted? Why am I not making $200,000 a year already? Why am I not like, this is, this can't stand. Um, and you're like, remember that your career was going to be like 40, maybe 50 years long. You're not even 10% of the way into it. If it's a baseball game, the first inning is not even over. It's just that you've already experienced a hundred percent of what you've experienced. And it's really hard to zoom out um I, tactically ways you can do that is like reading a lot of um i think reading or experiencing a lot of biographies like listening to if, you, if you're not a big reader like listening to the founders podcast uh, where he shows a lot of full life stories and you hear where other people were when they were 20 and there's a lot of people who you're already doing much better than you know not that it's a race not that it's a comparison but like remembering that life is long um and you will get a lot of shots at this. Hanging out with older people, befriending people who are further along in their career, who are 20 years in, and just like, they will listen to you talk and they will kind of nod knowingly about how impatient you are and be like, yeah, when I was 25, I was impatient too. Like, it's going to work out. It's going to be just fine. You're not even going to think about this week, next month. Like, relax. Um, so I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of lifestyle things like if you're in an echo chamber of 25 year olds who are all saying the same things and equally angsty about it, like it's very difficult to change that perspective and break out of it. Um, yeah. I, I mean, you're, you're in the ultimate thing here is like your inputs determine your outputs. So diversifying the types of your inputs and maybe getting some of that perspective, um, will instill the wisdom of age in you at a younger age. And it'll make it easier for you to think through, you know, do I want to have this person in my life in 10 years, in 30 years, in 50 years? Like, um, I've been thinking this way now in my career for, you know, 10 plus years, 15 years. And it's given, you know, I now know I have many relationships that I'm like, I'm going to be hanging out with this dude. Hopefully like we're still doing deals when we're 70 and we're just like old codgers, like calling each other, still trying to like make stuff work. Um, you know, if the world isn't just run by robots by then or whatever. So <laughs> thinking, um, thinking in those terms and starting as early as you can and just getting away from short termism, um, yeah, start starting those long term compounding like relationships and crafts and skills, uh, matters a lot and finding the right things to be impatient about, you know, it, I think the, the best line in all of Naval is maybe like impatience for action, patience for results. Yeah. Like, I repeat that to myself constantly, I tattoo it on your eyelids. Um, you know, it is, it is, that advice is almost unconditionally correct. I'm going to be honest with you. Whenever I send you an email for you to come to the show, I was like impatient with actions, patient with results. <laughs> He'll come through. And then all of a sudden I see the, the scheduling. I was like, yes, we did it. 
But <laughs> so it's partly your fault that I'm doing such a loving, Eric. <laughs> yes, you were you were impatient with action, and yeah, it, it worked. It worked. Listen, I'm trying to hack my way into getting that wisdom of life, and I found that this hack, at least you know, at least I'm finding it that way. Is if you go to a sauna, usually you see other people in a sauna, and like you can mm -hmm. get a great conversation with them about life. I've spoken with, spoken with people who escaped from the Soviet Union and then they came here to the United States and built a company and then they were like liaisons between, I shouldn't, maybe I should, I didn't sign an NDA, but maybe it's a secret because they were like liaisons between the Soviet Union and, and the US. But, I'm a secret, you can't tell that. Yeah, yeah, he was like, this is sauna talk. You you can't, <laughs> you can't speak sauna this talk. This doesn't leave the sauna. Yeah, so there's a ton of things that you mentioned that I really appreciate and, you know, these notes... I, I usually write notes when, when someone's talking, of course, to keep track of the conversation, but also to review them after I discuss with you. And so, for example, perspective of life. I keep thinking on, you know, how to, how can we all zoom out while, again, we are constantly being with those inputs that are usually playing against us. For example... Right now, there's been a, a loss being filed against dating apps, which are addictive, right? So creating relationships, you mentioned marriage. In our age, our generations, the younger generations are trying to feel, feel these bonds, create these bonds through dating apps, which then in and of themselves are transactionalists, are, are very superficial. And so imagine me seeing someone else as a catalog, swiping, rejecting them through their prompts and images, and then them seeing me as a catalog. And so the human fabric doesn't really allow for at least, you know, that's a hot take, but I don't, because there's been successful stories for sure. But the, I think the social fabric doesn't really allow for long-term ism to flourish naturally the way it might have been for previous generations, if I'm like explaining myself correctly. And then if you would like to weigh in on that before I go into a huge tangent, Eric, because I <laughs> tend to do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I think there's definitely some there are many tools for short termism um and many incentives towards it, right? Like you know, it's very different to spend 2 hours on TikTok than it is to spend 2 hours watching a movie. Um and you take different things away from it. It's different to spend 2 hours swiping than go on a 2-hour coffee date. Um I have observed in my own life that I am happier when I'm consuming longer form content. Like mm -hmm. I'm happier reading a book than a blog post. I'm happier reading a blog post than Twitter. Um, I'm happier listening to an audio book than a podcast. Like I, I, I'm not perfect about that and I enjoy podcasts and I still scroll Twitter, but like I have that, that loop in my head and I remind myself of that and I try to get it to have me, you know, reading more books and listening to more books. Um, you know, I'm happier to get a coffee with a friend than have a Zoom call, even though it takes longer and you have the, all the logistics and stuff like that. And I do think, um, so back to, back to the sort of principle where you get to determine your inputs and your inputs determine your outputs, um, or your, your inner state. Um, it takes strength and it takes willpower, you know, to resist the allure of that cheap dopamine, but it's not that art just pull your phone out right now, delete TikTok, delete Twitter, break the habit, put that shit away, delete Tinder, um, ask, text a friend to set you up on a blind date. Like you, if you just follow the path of least resistance, you will end up, you know, fat, broke, depressed, medicated, like these, these like self-interested algorithms or drugs or platforms like will mm -hmm. consume you. Um, I think, that is the form of that has changed, but the truth of that has always been there. Like, I don't know, 500 years ago, if you were, if you took the path of least resistance, you might end up, you know, a slave or a, a like in service of this feudal lord who just wastes your life or um, brainwashed in a cult or something like that. Like, there is always an allure for people with less willpower or less direction or, um, you know, there's the world is always dangerous for that kind of person. 
But more so than ever, like you have the opportunity to change your own path and to use these incredible tools for your own good. Um, I, I would never say it's easy, but I would certainly not say it's, it's impossible. Um, and honestly, like if you, it's also like, if you really think about it, just not that hard. It's not that hard to delete TikTok or Twitter. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to do that than, you know, think about what our, our parents or our grandparents had to go through to avoid, um, you know, a toxic ideology. They might've had to like hide away, leave all their belongings and escape a country to escape a toxic ideology. So like, what are you complaining about having to de delete some apps and open a book and go on a date? Like, mm -hmm. Let's go. This is not, this is not hard. You are not suffering. You just have to make decisions, um, to control your inputs. And like a wise person will change their environment because their environment will determine their outcome. I love that. That was, that was really well said. And like you say, it's just, it's such an easy choice, but at the end of the day, just trying to play devil's advocate, because that's thankfully I'm not a TikTok. uh, geek or whatever <laughs> how do you say it I'm, TikTok, I, I don't, instagram youtube maybe, shorts it's all the yeah. same yeah. i wouldn't i maybe i would go viral if i do this like on tiktok <laughs> doing the dances but no i don't think so but for example my generation has been at least with the ipad for at least 10 years and so my theory that i've been really thinking about with addiction and also you know i, I posted uh several neuroscientists trying to ask that question is that literally your brain chemistry changes. So like the cues, for example, in our previous generations, people when, for example, my grandpa or grandma, when they were bored, maybe uh, my grandma, she that's her painting uh, be behind me, she would get, get bored and she would paint paintings, right? When I get bored, it's my cue to scroll down Twitter or scroll down Instagram, right? You, so like the composition of the brain has changed in itself. And that's where I'm concerned because we're you don't think for it can life. change back? You don't think it can change back? I'm hoping. I'm, I'm, with these conversations, I, I'm hoping because, you know, we, we need to shed a light on it. But at the end of the day, it's to, I, I, see it, I see it around, around my, my circle. They, really, it's, it's a cue. When they wake up, it's just, let's go to Twitter. Let's go to Instagram. Sure. But it's also humans are incredibly adaptable. You know, if you, if you decided to commit to the habit of putting your phone, like leaving it in your living room or putting it in your, putting it in a safe or deleting the app from your phone, putting your phone in black and white. These are one-time decisions that can interrupt the, interrupt the pattern. Like put a paintbrush and a easel and a canvas, like mm -hmm. right next to your desk or right in front of your fridge. Like these, are, you know, it's, um, there, there is a methodology to changing patterns and brain chemistry and habits. And, you know, if you, if you seek out those tools and apply them, um, you know, I, I think humans are just incredibly, incredibly adaptable. Um, and the, the stories we tell ourselves are powerful. Like if you, if you tell yourself the story of, oh, I've been raised on an iPad, I'll never, you know, be able to get dopamine from anything that's not digital. Like, then why, then why would you undertake those steps? But if you believe, you know, you're adaptable and that there's more, there, there are many forms of dope, like forms of happiness that are not, um, don't really, they're not responsive to the like hedonic treadmill. Like they're as fulfilling every time. Um, I can't remember the whole list off the top of my head. I'm sure it's Googleable, but like workouts basically release the same amount of endorphins every time. Um, sex, love, kisses, like putting your hands in soil, feeling the sun on your skin, like, um, you know, sauna probably like, there's a lot of things like that, that, you know, your second hour on TikTok is not better than your first hour, uh, your second 10 minutes for that matter. Like it's yeah. just, it's just a pattern. Um, but it doesn't, that effort doesn't accumulate either, right? Like you're not getting anywhere. You're not getting closer. You're not going to be becoming a better painter. You're not getting closer to getting a painting done. Um, and honestly, for me, having written a book, having finished that book was life-changing in this way that we're talking about too, because it changed, like my motivation to tweet went down so drastically after I finished that book and saw the response to it. I'm like, oh my God, like this book is going to outlive me. Like my Twitter account, you know, I have a fair number of followers. I've been working on it for 10 years. Like that thing is going to, is already dust. Like nobody's going to miss it when it's gone. Like 
it will be replaced immediately. Um, I don't ever own it. Like this book is going to outlive me. Um, it will be, my kids will read it. Hopefully thousands or millions of other people's kids will read it or it'll be gifted or sit around on bookshelves. And having had that experience, I'm now like, Oh my God, like fuck Twitter, fuck blogs. Like, um, I love them. I'm bullish on podcasting and digital and all of that, but I'm like so much more fulfilled by writing a book or painting a painting or, um, just creating something. But it did take that first loop to be closed, to experience it. Um, so I hope people, you know, give, give something a try. Like writing doesn't have to be your thing. Maybe it's drawing, maybe it's painting, maybe it's sculpting, maybe it's working on your house. Um, it could be anything, but, uh, there's something about uh, pouring yourself into a craft that does change your perspective a little bit and gives you one of those kind of non-diminishing sources of, of satisfaction that can really change how you choose to spend your time and your satisfaction about doing it. Yeah, it's well said because, listen, when when I wrote my book, it was the, the most, the overarching theme was, you know, how can we honor our time on earth the best way? Mm -hmm. You know, is it, through a, is it through a 40 year career? Maybe, maybe it's not from everyone. Is it through building a, you know, is it through building a great resume? Is it through boasting, uh, you know, virtue signaling on LinkedIn about all of the companies we've been through, especially McKinsey? I don't know. For, <laughs> for some people, it might, you know, yeah. some people. But for me, when, when I was thinking about, like you're saying, building uh, things that will outlive us but the basic pretense the, mo the the initial factor of it all is creativity is our creative output it's it's unleashing that creative factor of our lives and so the way i think about honoring our time on earth is twofold is getting rid of of these things that we we're, we're discussing which are you know short termism and they're taking away literally infinitely valuable time on your life you, i know that balaji uh, on anthology of balaji you, you you write on how he wants to create an immortality you know he, he wants to he's bullish on us becoming you know immortals and we, we can debate that but i think that immortality can be a lot of ways for example immortality for you might be through your books immortality for my grandma will be you know this painting Immortality for me would be, you know, passing the baton of life and having kids. And so the, the key here is to understand that maybe these technologies, while they provide that satisfaction, quote unquote satisfaction, they're really, if you put it on perspective, like what you're saying, Eric, they're robbing you from your most precious asset, which is your time. Yeah. Uh, and Naval's got a good... Um a summary of this as he does most things, which is like the devil is cheap dopamine. Um, you know, whether that's sugar or TikTok or Instagram or porn or like whatever. Um, there's a, there's a lot of people like cheap dopamine sells and, and obviously it sells. Um, but it is on all of us to know that that's, that behavior is not in our best interest and to resist it whenever we get the chance. And that there's a real like meaningful satisfaction on the other side of breaking some of those tough habits. And especially in today's world, we're being bombarded with so much input that for example, the work you've done with the Naval, the Almanac of Naval and the anthology of Balaji, you're curating these ideas. And so you're allowing us to cut through the noise of everything that's happening and allow us to distill this quick idea, not quick ideas, but I, I say quick because they're, you know, I understand them, but they're also like timeless. So like what you say on, you know, impatience with actions, patience with results, that's such a clear idea, but that's, that's ingrained in the way I operate. And so how do you see your role, Eric, in this new era of, you know, instant information, rapid information, but, you know, for me, You've slowed down time with these books, but in the overarching sense of curators, how do you see the role of curators unfolding in this new era? Yeah, I think there's uh, there's a lot of value in curation, and the more 
like creation has gotten very cheap, right? Like anybody can tweet, anybody can blog, anybody can podcast. And there's a lot of pe- more people creating than ever before, which is incredible. And I don't want to change that. And I want that to accelerate. And I want more and more and more and more people to create more things. Um, along with that, I think the role of curation and recommendation becomes incredibly important. Like how are we going to find the best of the best of the things that are being created? And I think that there is still a really valuable human role to play in that i don't trust like it is not that i just don't trust the algorithms it's that algorithms may never be able to capture sort of the most important part of that experience of like humans sharing things with each other um but most of our selection right now is done by by algorithms um and so the curators yes share and select um there's a taste to that that i think is really important um and it's a fantastic way to sort of get to know someone get to trust someone find somebody whose world he resonates with yours or doesn't but you're f- learning something really interesting from them um the other i don't know that there's a this falls under this is kind of a subcategory of curator to me but i think there's an incredible value to be created in transforming mediums, which is really like what I've done, right? There's super valuable, timeless lessons being shared on the internet every day that are just disappearing into infinity in these like ephemeral platforms and these super real time algorithms. And what I did, what I've done is just rescue them from disappearing and put them into a form factor that is much more timeless. You know, books are thousands of years old. Hopefully they are still around in thousands more years. And, um, if I can capture, you know, 10 years of someone's like most useful ideas and put them in a book and that capsule can continue to exist and endure, then that's value that's been created on the other side. Uh, I'm going to mention founders podcast again, like there's nobody better. David is making incredible content and he's reading books and sharing them in the form of a podcast for people that don't have 40 hours to read, you know, an enormous biography or read the hundreds of biographies that David has. You can listen and sort of get value from his experience and his wisdom and his time reading those books and learn some of the most important lessons from them. And he's transforming mediums. He's creating value. He's moving from a book to digital. And there's incredible value in that too. So I think of him as a, as a curator and a creator. And uh, there's just, uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of work to be done that's valuable work to do. Uh, I think I mean, it's a, a Munger quote, say like the best thing a human being can do is help another human to know more. And I don't ever feel this pressure to come up with great ideas. I think that's a, I, I don't think people trying to come up with great ideas are egotistical. I just find it like the, the path of least resistance and least pressure for my ego is like collecting and recognizing and sharing great ideas, right? Like I don't sit here in front of a blank page and try to create genius. I just try to recognize it when I see it. And when I see an incredible line from Charlie Munger or Naval or Apology or Elon Musk or Steve Jobs or Claire Hughes Johnson or like there is genius all around us and we just need to recognize and share the good ideas and hopefully the good ideas overpower the bad, you know, like the, the closing of my podcast is always, you know, every, every good idea you adopt, every new friend you make brings us one step closer to utopia. So like, let's fight the bad ideas. Let's embrace the good ones. Let's be sure we label them correctly. Um, cause that's not always easy. And you know, that, that's what moves us all forward. There is, this chapter in in the anthology of Balaji where you discuss the mindset of abundance, right? And what you've touched on right now is, you know, what he said, which is win and help win, outlives Mm -hmm. always live and let live. And so what I really, when I think about the books that I have right now next to me, I do think about Naval and I do think about Balaji, but I think about you especially. I think about you taking the time, the consideration, and also, like you say, it's just, it's such a, an incredible amount of work that involves trying to distill what really matters and putting it in a infinite form, which is physical, paradoxically. And it blows my mind because, like you say, we've, we've become so obsessed in trying to come with a new idea that we forget about what Nassim Taleb says, the Lindy effect, right? You know, the Lindy ideas. And so 
I really like and I appreciate you doing that because at least for me, when I when I think about, for example, these conversations or what I'm trying to share with the world, I'm in a way, I I love giving credit to people. I just, I, I love doing it. I, I just, yeah. I, I find that so satisfactory that I don't, uh, it's it's crazy to live the, to think that we're still because I know that you're an um, extremely optimistic uh, individual that, that I really appreciate because we kind of think of life of being the the, the normal convention of life is that it's a zero sum game that if I win you need to lose but people like you are showing us Balaji Navala showing us that a win win a uh, 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 all of us win win scenario. It's better for everyone because, you know, the overarching theme of this conversation also, Eric, is we're trying to, you know, literally build infinite. And how do we build infinite when someone else loses? So how, how can we, you figure out that out? How can we build progress long term in life when someone else loses? Yeah, so it's a, it's a good question. I think it's an important thing for everyone to understand. I don't... Um, there are domains that are zero sum and it's important to understand that in order to understand which domains are truly positive sum. Um, there's a mistake. It, it was a tremendous mistake and a very dangerous one to apply the zero sum mindset to every aspect of life. Um, cause the most important games are, are positive sum. Um, but you know, we come up, if you think about how most people spend their first 20 years of their lives, it's in the classroom, it's playing sports. Um, and so in a classroom, you know, there's no limit on the number of A's that, that can be given out, but there is a sense of like, I've got to beat the person next to me. We've all, we're all learning the same thing and we've all like, I got to learn it better. And, or like I'm a piece of shit. If I'm like, if I get a D on this test when everybody else got an A, but I'm awesome if I got an A and everybody else got a D. And that's really not at all how the real world works. And it takes a long time to realize that you've come up in that environment and that you've been trained to see that that's how the world works. The way the real world works, at least the business and environments and industries that I choose to operate in, positive sum is much more like the better a grade that the average that the class gets on average, the more points everybody in the room gets, and you should all rely on each other's strengths, weaknesses, and different perspectives to get a better grade for everybody in the room. And I've never once in my life been given a test that was cooperative using everyone's strengths in the classroom to benefit everybody else. Um, I've never played a sport where like both teams win at the end of the game by like scoring the most points, right? Like <laughs> we don't, we have very few models in our early lives for positive sum environments. And if you don't have somebody who shows you the way, or if you don't get involved in a culture like, like Silicon Valley or, um, and Silicon Valley is competitive, don't get me wrong, but it is very like positive sum. Um, you know, early stage venture capital is quite positive. Some wealth building, uh, in business building and entrepreneurship is very generally positive. Some people are all playing their own games and trying to help each other win. Um, I have been very fortunate to like find my way into those environments and recognize them and appreciate them and only even choose in within those to interact with people who also have that kind of positive, some worldview and relationships with, with each other. Um, you know, if you go to a industry like, um, like real estate offices, like some real estate offices are very zero sum. There's a fixed amount of houses. People are really like have their elbows out and they keep deals from each other or um, there's only so much business to go around and they kind of like like elbows out to their peers and um, push each other around. Wall Street is kind of like that, you know, like the call center pits, people competing for, for customers and stabbing each other in the back to get like promotions or think, like the political environments. Um, you want to get out of those as quickly as you can once you recognize them because the longer you stay in those environments, the more your, your worldview of everything will become zero sum, the more you will see the whole world like that. And if you see the world like that, you're likely to excuse yourself from some morals about screwing people over to get ahead because you tell yourself that's the only way to do it. Um, you may not be generous with others because you think that it's not going to help you in any way. And if you're not generous to them, then they're not going to reciprocate generosity. And so you've like cut off this positive feedback loop. Um, 
so you know it find your way into those positive sum environments as quickly as you can recognize when you're not in one and get out of it um try to create one amongst your like default to generosity you know the, the game theory of like give first give second give third like humans do reciprocate kind deeds almost always um they also reciprocate you know offenses so if you go around pissing people off you're gonna have a lot of enemies uh and if you go around giving things of value to people um you're gonna have a lot of friends and the people with a lot of friends always 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 do better than the people with a lot of enemies um and if you if you you know just watch dramatic tv shows you may not think that's how the world works but that's how the world works <laughs> My first encounter with with a zero sum game was in the corporate world, where I saw that you know all of a sudden I changed to someone who was all of a sudden playing a game that I didn't really, I've never really signed up for, which was I have to get that promotion, I have to really please my boss, you know, and that means that my coworker is a rival, and then all of a sudden I just you know switched, I had this quarter life crisis, and I said no, this is not how I honor my time on earth. Then the book came about, but Eric. We, again, like the overarching theme of, of the conversation is, and how you write on the anthology of Balaji's, you know, we're trying to grow to infinity. Humanity is trying to, to grow to infinity. And so here the question is, what I think that the saying was, what you don't measure, don't get, what you don't measure, it not, doesn't get progress. Or what, there is just this saying, you know, that says, I don't know if you probably know it, um, that says, if you don't measure something, it won't it won't progress or something like that. Yeah. I think it's... what gets what gets measured gets managed is like a, exactly. a common one. That's the one. That's the one I was thinking about. Yeah. yeah. So the question here is because I also know that you, you write on it on the anthology of Balajis. You know how should we measure progress when we're trying to build infinite? Is it progress in terms of you know GDP? Is, is it progress would it mean in a you know optimistic society would it be you know happiness should be the way we should measure progress i know that balaji says life expectancy but in your perspective in in the way forward trying to build this massive idea which is infinite how should we measure progress i think uh some can be measured some can't i think if we expand what we measure we'll get better at that and there's some interesting ideas for that um i think number of humans is actually like a really good metric it's a little bit in contention like i think you'll find some naturalists or some environmentalists who are like no there's too many humans i think that's a such a stupid and dangerous way to think um it's a very self-loathing way to think like of your of yourself and your species right um and I have a quite a different perspective on that. Um, I think happiness is a good one. I think wealth is a good one, but it needs to be viewed broadly, like very, um, very long arc. I think, uh, David Deutsch, uh, you, you, you keep referring to infinity. So I hope, um, if, if you haven't read that, it's on your list. The beginning of infinity by David Deutsch is an incredible book that Naval has talked a lot about. And there's a, a great podcast called, um, talk cast about, breaking down that book TOK. Um, it, it really sets the frame of the fact that humans are at this in interesting inflection point where we've created all of the beginning, the beginning of the recipe that will let us grow towards infinity. Um, we have some incredible technology. We have this theory of knowledge about like how to continue to learn new things and build new things. And that really there's no limit to what we can build, what we can learn. And as we learn more, we unlock new natural resources. Like there's all kinds of things that we, that are useful to us now that did not used to be useful to us. And that can continue and continue and continue. Um, so we can have humans, you know, all over the solar system, all over the galaxy. Like we can expand consciousness. We can build new things. We can live, you know, in space, underwater. There's all kinds of cool stuff that can happen. And uh, the, the sort of, turning inwards of like, oh, there's too many people, the technology's bad, we're ruining the environment. It's like, no, human, humanity is this beautiful gift. We are the only conscious beings that we are aware of. We are the universe, like looking at itself. And is a sunrise beautiful or is it beautiful because we're here to observe the beauty of the sunrise and consider it beautiful? And 
if from that perspective, like, you know, the more time you spend in nature, the more you appreciate, like nature can be brutal and raw. And if humans disappeared tomorrow, the, a lot of things would still be just out there killing each other. Um, and this sort of bizarre modern environmentalism that's like, no, we must like protect every natural space for its own sake for nature to continue killing each other without our involvement is, is just like kind of bizarre and believing that there should be less humanity and less consciousness and that we should stop technological progress that's creating abundance and alleviating human suffering um, is so, is so misguided. I think in, you know, in a hundred years, as we look back at that, it will seem like a totally insane sort of um, outlook on life, but we're still in the midst of it now. And so it, feels very common you know you talk to a lot of people with that view and you and then you question them on it and they don't even really know where they got it or why and they don't believe it to a deep level um it's just been like instilled in us through some th through the air through the water that we we've grown up in um but it leads to all kinds of bizarre thinking that doesn't orient us towards towards this growth towards infinity which is so like the, the destination infinity doesn't necessarily matter it's the steps along the way it's the sense that every time we invest in a better technology or we create a better way to do things or we create a way to do more with less that now more people can exist now more people can be safer or be more well fed or be more well watered like we've actually decreased energy consumption we should be drastically increasing it energy consumption is not bad just the fact that we are consuming energy in ways that harm the environment that's bad but we can invent we ways to create energy harm the environment like nuclear energy solar we just have gone in our own way ideologically from deploying that to its maximum usefulness and we need to if we were oriented towards infinity we'd be appropriately oriented towards abundance in the short term which is maximizes human flourishing, maximizes uh, human well-being, maximizes happiness, maximizes, maximizes generosity to our fellow humans. You know, if you are saying like, no, we can't have that incremental progress. Okay. Who are you going to take it away from? Like, who are you saying needs to stay in poverty or, you know, being anti-energy is being, or anti-progress is being pro-poverty. And it's coming from a place of privilege of being like, oh, I'm the one who escaped. I'm already fine. I have enough. So no one else should have any more. That's psychotic. People who are psychotic don't tend to see it that way. Um, and they're trying to alleviate the poverty in other ways instead of realizing that, you know, just investing in new technology and developing these things and deploying them and being like pursuing infinity creates abundance in the short term. Wow. So I There's, probably answered way too many questions there, but you pulled us through. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was, that was wonderful. That, that was really, really a amazing i really appreciate it because there's just so much there that i can pull off of and there's this saying that i i keep thinking about you know you, you mentioned people who are possessed and i keep thinking that people don't possess ideologies ideologies possess people they, they're not aware that they're being handled by you know they're being persuaded by something they don't really control they don't have a, an idea about it and i think that through conversations, I'm going to plug my num the name of my of my podcast. We can take away that that ideology. At, at least, even me, for example, before reading the anthology of Balajin, deep, getting deeper into nuclear, I was kind of uh, possessed by the idea that nuclear is dangerous. I might I should be against it. And then, when every every time I remember on dinners, when every time the nuclear conversation came, I was the first one saying no, Fukushima. And then, oh, yeah, yeah, Fukushima. And then end of conversation. No one will discuss <laughs> Fukushima. But like you say, it's just having that open mind. I don't know if, I don't know how it happened, but I it was just these nudges of, of, of possibility of there's another perspective that we can discuss. And the perspective, I want to say something. Oh, go ahead. Well, I've, got a, well, I've got a few um, interviews with nuclear experts on my podcast that were instrumental in sort of bringing me along, changing my mind that I've sent to a number of people in, in, you know, our parents' generation who have changed their mind on that and been like, oh yeah, that maybe, maybe there is something to that. You know, the technology's developed a lot and Fukushima in particular was not a nuclear disaster. It was a natural disaster. And maybe 
undetermined if zero or one people actually died from nuclear radiation in that disaster. But like we have this mental image of it being like, oh my God, it was a catastrophe. Millions of people die, have died from our carbon-based like energy system that we use constantly. Like nuclear is by far the safest thing that we have. Um, so anyway, there, yeah, I've got a my whole trail of thought there is like exists on my podcast. Um, but yeah, don't be afraid to be that person at the dinner party and going like, well, actually there's something to be said. Like nuclear has come a long way. There's a lot of new changes. There's new developments. There's like the waste has never harmed anybody. Like there are very few, many fewer disasters than people think. It's still the safest form of energy generation. It's the only one that with the hope of like pushing us even further into these. So yeah, don't, don't shy away from those, um, from those conversations. And I think being brave enough to question some of those ideas that we just naturally came up with is very important. Absolutely. And and one of, of the themes that I will now adopt on the family dinners will be, you know, because I, I didn't think about technology this way before reading the anthology of Balaji and listening to your ideas and reading them as well was that, you know, there is a moral case to do for technology. Technology is not just, you know, a gadget or the Apple Vision Pro it's not just about, you know, having the next iteration of the iOS system or whatever. There is a moral case for technology. And just that's the question that I would love for you to take on. But to give you credit, I know that in, you know, Rolling Fund, the, the fund that you manage, you're investing in kind of these companies that are, you know, uh, I think it was one of the uh, prosthetic limbs that are, you know, going to be replaced batteries that might you know be bought by elon musk for millions he's asking for them but there is a moral case for technology and i would love for you to shed a light for our listeners on what is that this case how how can we shed a light on this yeah i'm glad you zeroed in on that because i think it's the most important idea in that whole book which is why it, it came first um and I hope if people take one thing away from it, it's it's that, right? Like we have this perception that there's like a technology industry and it's mostly made of software and, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's iPhones and, you know, apps. Um, technology is the like frontier of what is possible with currently existing human technology. And we should be all deeply interested in pushing that frontier. And it historically, technology has been, you know, railroads, electrification, air conditioning, um, telephones, ships, cars, like horses, domesticating horses, even like there are every time we have made a big step in technology, we have gotten, you know, safer, more comfortable, more abundant lives that allow us to be, you know, spend less time in zero sum hunting, gathering, like making war on each other and more, more cooperative, um, more positive, more peaceful, more abundance, more like, and then more resources to then invest in moving those frontiers of technology again. Um, so every industry and every role has a, there's an opportunity to reinvest in technology and push it. You don't have to come invest in like, you know, frontier battery chemistry technology with me to make progress. And like wherever you are working, just like adopt a little bit of technology. And all that really means is like finding ways to do more with less using tools. Um, you know, like the, the example that I use in my, um, in my leverage course, like to, in technology, sort of this compounding force of, of leverage, like, you know, if you're a lumberjack without an ax, you're not going to make much progress. If you have a tool like an ax, you're going to make, a, you're going to be able to fell, you know, take down a tree an hour. If you have a chainsaw, new technology came along. Now you can do 10 trees an hour. If you have a tractor, if you have a team, you have coordinated people. Um, and the, the machines now that do like forestry are absolutely incredible. They can like cut, turn, shave a tree, plane it down, load it on a truck in, in seconds. And it's unbelievable. And that is, you know, that is the supply chain of technology behind you being able to have a roof over your head. It's because we are doing every step of this thing in a more efficient way. And a good example that we're dealing with right now is self-driving cars. You know, 10, 10 years ago, the concept of self-driving cars came out and Google was kind of like, Hey, I think we might be able to do this. And everyone's like, Oh my God, cool. Can't come soon enough. It's such a tragedy. Like hundreds of thousands of people have died in car accidents over the last few years. Like we must have this technology and now it exists and it's here and everyone's protesting it. You know, San Francisco is like blocking these cars and 
burning them. And like, who are these people who are against self-driving cars? Like, what is the case? Show me the moral case for stopping self-driving cars that are going to be safer, that are going to be, that are going to relieve, you know, hundreds of hours of menial labor for people who have to sit sedentary driving a car. Um, you know, every person who dies in a, you know, drunk driving or car accident right now is a fucking tragedy. And everybody who is slowing down the development of these new technologies that allows these deaths to happen, that is morally unconscionable to me. And like, I don't understand the worldview of the person who's standing in the way of that new technology. And this example is just so purely cut and dry, obviously better that it's a good one to use. Um, but I do think it, anybody would be very hard pressed to name a technology in human history that has not done more good than harm. You know, you can always come up with a, a bad case or a risk or um, a way that an evil person could use a technology to perpetrate evil. But almost every technology that I can think of in the whole of human history has done more good than harm. And more technology leads to more good for more people. Um, and we should all be like, we should all know that we should always act in that sense. We should, you know, vote for politicians who believe that. We should work for people who believe that. We should carry that into our workplaces. We should carry that into the dinner conversations. Um we should demand progress from our countries, from our politicians, from our communities, mock, ridicule, and push out people that stand in the way for stupid ideological reasons because they're holding back, you know, abundance and eventually infinity from from all of us. Um, and it's, it, you know, it's not, change is not easy. Like humans have this built in brake pedal that like oh my god the world is changing around me fucking stomp on that brake I, I don't want to learn a new thing it's risky scary don't make me do it um i like things the way they are and that tends to happen even more for older people um and that tends to happen when they are in positions of power you know 50 or 60 year old people are less adapted to change on average there are many many exceptions but like less adapted to change than younger people and younger people are the ones who come up and say we should change some things and like when they're in their 30s and 40s they have like enough power to maybe change a few things before they get set in their ways and gain enough power and then they're like all right no more change um so really like investing in these like young ambitious people giving them the you know the opportunity to make changes and push us forwards you know use that youthful energy um don't be too set in your ways uh, there's so much good that feels so close and if we could just like grease the way for it a little bit and welcome it and pull it forward um you know we we have an incredibly exciting you know next hundred years ahead of us and you know we, we are owed another industrial revolution like you know what what happened the leap in material abundance that happened through railroads and telegraphs and electricity and internal combustion and gas and steel, like all of those technologies happening all at once and reinforcing each other and accelerating all of us, like created the life that we are used to today. Otherwise it'd be like outhouses, horses, um, and farming. Like that is a much worse life. And we have another hundred X leap in material wealth available to us in the next hundred years, but it can be 30 or 40 years if we play our cards right, or it could be 200 years or never if we shit the bed and do a terrible job of embracing and investing in these new technologies and deploying them as quickly and effectively as we can. So I'm all in on supporting that kind of future and supporting people who are pursuing it, which is why I, I work so hard to kind of find those people, support them through my platform, through my podcast with capital. So I, I find people who are willing to invest in these kind of futures and help channel capital to the people who are working on, you know, my one liner is like, I fund obsessive geniuses building utopian technologies. So if you want to put capital to work on that, like throw it in my fund, I will get it to these people. Um, they're building all kinds of crazy, incredible things that'll make the future better. And I hope we can all give them all the support we can possibly muster. Um, and, and our older selves and our children and our grandchildren will be very grateful for our efforts. Well, listen, one of my questions, I know we're, we're short on time and I, I want to respect your Is it time. Because Mary? I keep going on 15 minute rants. I love it. I mean, I, I wish <laughs> I could stay, you know, the whole, the whole day with it because it's really, it's really just, I really appreciate it. And it's so insightful. If it wasn't insightful, it would be just Eric, just, you know, I would do it like this, but it's, <laughs> you're articulating great ideas. Um, one of the questions I had was, you know, what is your utopian vision of society? I think you've addressed it in a, um, 
very far away during this conversation, I think we could explore that and how do we capitalize on it. But I had another two more questions that I'm going to throw to you and you choose which one serves best for your for your synapses right now. I will I will answer them all in much shorter versions than I have previously. <laughs> How's that? Here here they go. Back to back to back. So there's a line that I really appreciated in the anthology of Balaji what that was nothing is more costly than incompetent leadership. And you touched on politicians and you know what I, I don't want to discuss politics because you know our conversation deserves more than that. But it's also a crucial part, and, and you mentioned it, that, you know, politicians do play a role in the world that we live in and how it shapes. And if we're going to, you know, live up to your vision of these next 100 years, will there be another industrial revolution? And so the question that I came up, of, up with was, you know, what? why does it seem that we're so obsessed with choosing bad leaders for government, incompetent leaders? Why, why does it seem that, you know, this is politics i we don't have to get to it but why does it seem that we're in on the cusp of an industrial revolution which is ai we have two presidential candidates that are almost in their 80 80 years how how will they manage these these ideas and how will they, you know it's it's even yeah. hard for me at the at right now so yeah i i, I have no um i have no unique insight or answers on that that's not my domain i do think our uh, our current selection system in the u.s is not serving us particularly well um but it has in the is produced great leaders in the past so hopefully um hopefully we'll see some changes there in the future i love that short answer and i love that we don't we don't have to talk politics i just wanted to to ask that question but you know i think that the second question that i didn't i didn't ask back to back which was you know you touched on younger generations and as we wrap up i think this is the, the perfect last question is that you know where should the most conscientious, industrious, and highly individuals and young individuals focus their attention in in a perspective where we're trying to build for infinite? Like how, how should we really tailor in into trying to fight that good fight, Eric? I think that starts with the mindset that we talked about here and a, a long-term, like positive sum mindset that focuses on using technology to create abundance, right? Um, I'm, I'm not going to say there's any specific industries or anything like that because I, I love when people, I think the best thing is for everyone to kind of follow their heart and their interests and their unique upbringing, um, lean into the skills that you have and the interests that you have. And whatever domain you go into, just go into it with that positive sum mindset with a really big vision and knowing that you know, searching for ways to apply technology to better that domain. I don't, I don't care what you work on. I don't care what skills you bring to the table. Um, but if you value those things and you push for, you know, grand progress, a much higher pace, um, doing things better, like, I don't know exactly what grade like human humanity as a whole deserves as like our competence level right now. Like if you were God and grading us as a teacher on like how well we were playing the game that we were given, it's definitely not a hundred percent. I don't know that it's over 50. Um, it, if you, if you, Naval has a great thought experiment about this actually, which is like, imagine a perfectly educated population. Imagine 8 billion people who all have, you know, a, a mechanical engineering, like master's degree, and they were software engineers, and they were tinkerers, and they like, understood physics, and they were well read in philosophy and understood, you know, alignment and long term orientation, and were perfectly cooperative, like, trusted each other seamlessly, like, imagine what that population could achieve. It is unbelievable how far from optimal we are from that, from the perspective of that sort of um, just mental exercise. So there's, from that perspective, there's so many ways to move us closer to that on a daily basis of just like doing the work, you know, on your desk or in your company or at your school or in your community well, having a high standard for things done well and competently, um, showing others how well things can be done, bringing them along, um, sharing what you know, sharing it generously, like I think all of that is amazing. Um, 
it, it, this sort of leads to the answer to your other question, which is my, my actual like vision for that utopia. I think, I think it is, um, I think it comes from that higher bar and I think it's a mix of really deeply appreciating the technology, which we've been talking about for 20 minutes, but also really deeply appreciating our roots as like biological beings um, and participating in this ecosystem, right? Which is, gets back a little bit to what we were talking about in the beginning about, you know, these sources of dopamine that are not resist, that are resistant to the hedonic treadmill that are equally as fulfilling every time that respects our environment instead of pits us at odds against it. Like I see a utopia where we are like very much embracing, you know, how good it feels to be around each other, how good it feels to do physical manual work, you know, not 12 hours a day, but two hours a day, how good it feels to have your hands in the dirt to grow a garden, how good it feels to be in the sun or swim in the ocean, but also how good it, how, positive it is to create technology to build robots to generate nuclear electricity nuclear power um like i think those two things can coexist in the optimal sort of world that i see us getting to like we can't get too far away from our roots of what makes us happy and what makes us fulfilled um but we can really push the dial much farther on the tools and the systems that we rely upon to create that environment for us um, and I think it'll take a lot of progress in both of those but th- I see them overlapping in this really beautiful way um, that that I think could make people really happy and really fulfilled and provide this this like, positive path forward for for humanity that's uh, abundant at every step and moves us closer to infinity and is good for for the universe like doesn't pit us against our um, you know our environment but lets us make maximal use of the resources that are around for our own, you know, our own thriving. Well, listen, Eric, you've gained a subscriber for that utopian vision. I subscribe a hundred percent to that. And I appreciate you saying it. I appreciate you getting back to that question because I kind of like fumbled with <laughs> politics. Shouldn't, I shouldn't mention it because the conversation and your ideas don't really, it's, don't. It is an important input. I, it truly, I just, um, it's not one that I, have much expertise in honestly like i i um i know how important it is i know that it's a function it's a variable on the whole thing um i find it very difficult to imagine solutions but i also know that there are really smart people in these institutions working on it i know that there's a whole next generation who um you know is is excited to sort of step into some of these leadership roles with with new ideas like i'm very optimistic about the future at, at large and i do think you know intelligent policies play a hugely important role in developing some of these things and the government has developed you know did the fundamental research for a lot of the technology that we rely on today like it is really important um and the government has tried to do things that supported you know they did a huge push on nanotech in the 90s that actually like the institute the academic institutions like messed up and the grant giving institutions um sort of fumbled the opportunity to push that particular technology forward um there's a whole story about that in in the book where's my flying car which is a big like sort of red pill to me for a lot of these ideas and i recommend to, to many people and i've gifted it a lot of times so um it is a very important thing. I think many people and politicians in the industry, in, in government, are, are trying their best. Um, but yeah, we should all respect the power that it has to to accelerate or decelerate, you know, the the utopian visions and the, the well being of all its citizens. So um, yeah, let's let's try to educate people. Let's try to vote for people who sh- share our values and have this positive something. Um, you know, so it's. it's these are these are all every little bit helps. Like every little bit helps. Listen, Eric, I truly appreciate you joining me. I, you know, I it's it's exciting to and daunting in in both you know senses of the world of the world. Trying to subscribe to that utopian vision, but also trying to live a life where I can strive towards building infinity. It's it's so abstract, but the idea is so exciting and, and thinking about how we can leverage us, leverage each other, leverage other people to uplift other people. That's infinite in itself. It doesn't really need to be landing to Mars, but what, like you say, is building energy sources so more people can push what their creative, creative interests might be, you know, right there. Their potential is right there, but they don't have the resources to. So that's infinity in itself. And so Eric, thank you for joining me. I truly appreciate you. Hope to 
So I'm going to keep loving you for a second edition. <laughs> so great for that. And Thank I'm going to leave your, you know, I'm going to also lobby my, my audience to really get a hold of your books, both the books and also your podcast, your newsletter, everywhere. I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be a soldier for your fight. So, Eric, thank you for joining me. I appreciate you. We're all in it together. Thank you. <laughs>